Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. If you're watching or listening to the podcast on YouTube, you might be wondering, what am I doing in front of the camera? Well, the podcast, uh, Dr. GPCR podcast started four years ago, and I thought it was time for us to do something differently. Therefore, from now on, the introductions and outros of the podcast will be recorded with the camera on. Before we dive into this episode, I have a few announcements to make. First, I'd like to talk to you about the Dr. GPCR University that we launched in February of 2024. The goal is to provide courses and content on all aspects of GPCR research to support you, our community. We kicked off the first course of the university by partnering with Dr. Terry Kanakin, who taught a class about applying pharmacology to drug discovery. The class was a great success. Mark your calendars for May 9th, as we are partnering with Dr. Sam Hoare, who will be building on the concepts taught by Dr. Kanakin and will be showing you how to analyze your data. The course is split up into four modules. The first module will be about analyzing concentration curve response data. The second one will be about analyzing agonist pharmacology data. The third one about antagonist pharmacology data. And the last one will be focusing on new dimensions of activity including allosterism and, allosterism and kinetics. Learn how to handle allosteric modulator data, how to best analyze it and quantify activity in support of medicinal chemistry and target research. Please note that we are very excited to be offering five complimentary individual spots to anyone who'd like to join the course and lives in a developing country. This will be on a first come, and for a served basis. And if you'd like to join Dr. Hoare's workshop on any of our next classes, we'll make a Google form available to you. I also wanna take a moment to highlight that if you are in a developing country and you would like to access all the content in the ecosystem by getting a Dr. GPCR ecosystem premium plan, we do offer a 90% discount on this plan. If you'd like to take advantage of this offer, or if you are facing financial hardship and even with a 90% discount, you are unable to join us, we invite you to email us at hello at drgpcr.com. We are here to help. The second announcement I'd like to make is about the endocrine and metabolic GPCRs meeting. What are you doing April 22nd and 23rd? Join me and our GPCR colleagues for the inaugural edition of the endocrine metabolic GPCRs meeting taking place in the UK. This event will bring together scientists from both academia and industry to exchange data, technologies, and ideas in the field on GPC endocrine metabolic GPCRs. This meeting is organized by Bioscientifica and endorsed by the Society for Endocrinology. I'd like to uh, say a special thank you to Professors Aileen Hanyalolu, Davide Calibero, Car Dr. Caroline Gorvin, Dr. Alejandra Tomas and Professor Peter McCormick for putting together the scientific program of this very exciting meeting. The third announcement I'd like to make is for you to mark your calendar for this year's Dr. GPCR Symposium. This year we're holding three events which we have planned, for which we have planned talks, poster presentations, and panel discussion. Anyone at any level working on GPCRs or related proteins it was welcome to give a talk as we aim to democratize our events. If you have a story that you'd like to share in the form of a poster presentation, you're also welcome to join us. It doesn't have to be a full story. It doesn't have to be a full poster. Just bring in a couple of slides that you can use as a visual aid to discuss your project with your peers and colleagues. March 15th, this year was the first, the, was when we held the first Dr. GPCR symposium and we talked about GPCR activation and signaling. It was a great success. We've had almost 100 people join us for the entire length of, length, uh, length of the conversations that we had and the talks that were presented. The next symposium, however, will be on June 7th and will be focusing on structural insights into GPCR activation. And then on October 11th, we'll dive deeply into GPCRs as therapeutic targets. If you'd like to join us, if you'd like to give a talk or present a poster at our event, please email us at hello at drgpcr.com. If you want to join us to these events, these events are free. You just have to become a Dr. GPCR ecosystem free site member, and you'll be able to get access to the link to join the, the talks. And now let's dive into this episode. Hello. 
Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. And this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are, I have the pleasure of having with me Dr. Dar John Yanetsko. John, welcome. And uh, I did Yanetsko. My bad. Sorry. It's <laughs> Yanetsko. And see, that's the Hungarian in me. All right. Let's start this. <laughs> We're not going to cut this off because I think this makes it even more fun. John Yanetsko, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for, for having the opportunity to, to talk today. I really appreciate it. And I don't mind if it's Yanetsko or Janetsko. Um, <laughs> I was so focused. on the world you come from and your heritage, you might pronounce it differently. Differently, absolutely. It's really nice to have you on. Uh, let's start at the beginning. Could you please introduce yourself? Tell, tell us who you are and what do you do? So who I am is um, I am currently an instructor in Brian Kabilka's lab at Stanford University. Um, I will be moving to start my own lab in a few months, a little bit later this year at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Uh, and I have been working the majority of my time in Brian's lab, really trying to understand how GPCRs are deactivated and regulated um, by arrestin proteins. And um, I've also done work thinking about how post-translational modifications on receptors are able to modulate their activity. Congratulations on the new job. Um, oh, thank you so much. It's, it's really awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. And every time I hear that someone got a new academic position, a job, I have a bunch of ideas as to how we could support all these new PIs. So once we stop recording, I can, I can maybe share a couple of ideas uh, with you on that, on, on that front. So, yeah, and it, well, I was just going to say it. It's 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 a very uh, you know we we were very fortunate. So my wife and I will both be assistant professors there, uh, and so that was you know possibly something we can talk about later in the in the discussion. But it was uh, it's no small feat I think to arrange something that that works out uh, for two people who are looking for. Um, academic positions, you know, at the same institution, and there's a lot of considerations that go into it, and a lot of work that goes into making it happen. I, I well, thank you for 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 sharing that information with us. And I think, in general, looking for two jobs in the same city is already difficult, but looking for two academic jobs at the same institution, it's it's almost a one in a million, or it's it's a miracle. It's very difficult. To get these positions, based on what I'm hearing, but I'm I'm really curious, uh, you 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 know uh, about the story behind how you were both we were both able to to get these uh, your positions. But before we do that, um, I was wondering, did you always know you wanted to be a scientist? No, uh, no, definitely not. So yeah, I can I can now that I've kind of given a little bit of sort of where. Um, where I am right now, uh, I can maybe speak a little bit for sort of how I kind of got into science and and how I started in in my journey. And actually, I I came from a, a family where no one had previously gone to college. That wasn't that wasn't something that um, my parents were from uh, pretty poor families that. Uh, my dad had immigrated to Canada from Germany post-World War II. Um, and then my mother grew up uh, in Canada, but from um, a Ukrainian Ukrainian family. Uh, and, you know, they had come from Ukraine with not also not a lot of, of resources and not a lot of money. And so both of my parents had had really been forced to, um, you know, needed to, to get jobs right away. Um, and so my dad worked in sales and in various capacities. And um, my mother had been a secretary until I was born and then re ultimately retired and, and left the workforce. Um, and so I think, you know, what had I didn't really start thinking I wanted to be a scientist until partway through 
high school or thinking about science as, as a career opportunity. Um, I actually thought that I wanted to be more in like creative fields. So I had thought I wanted to work in like a field like architecture. I liked building things. I like designing things from scratch. Um, you know, I wasn't a wonderfully talented painter, but um, I, I enjoyed sketching a lot of landscape work and, and designing layouts of buildings and things like that when I was a kid. Yeah, in high school, I ended up having a, a high school teacher who, or a number of really good high school teachers. Um, and I guess I was able to, I was always interested in kind of learning the next, the next things beyond what we had covered in class. So I ended up learning kind of the more advanced physics and math curriculum. And that kind of made me start thinking about uh, a lot of these academic high school competitions. Yeah. And so just, you know, maybe I could do these things for fun. Um, so a lot of math contests and then some physics contests. And ultimately I found some chemistry contests that I thought were pretty cool. And I liked that chemistry felt very much like I was able to build things in my head, right? And I could really think about how to, how to that, that idea of thinking of something and then designing it and putting it, putting it together from pieces. Uh, I think really appealed to me about chemistry. And so I was, um, I had found some competition, uh, chemistry competition that um, was basically this national, uh, national, national chemistry Olympiad. And through that, I ended up you know, I did the test, submitted my stuff and um, got asked to come to uh, a, one of the provincial, which is, I guess, the equivalent of like a statewide. Yeah. So one of the provincial training camps. Uh, and that was really my first time ever going to like a university setting. Uh, so it was held at the University of Toronto. Um, and we would basically it was just a weekend and we had practical exam and a laboratory exam and coming from a situation where I had only had, uh, you know, a high school chemistry lab and seen what that looked like. It was pretty crazy to all of a sudden be touring through these chemistry settings that were research labs and university labs and yeah. they had you know tricked out with all this really cool equipment and um so yeah I, I really enjoyed that weekend and it also felt like this was an opportunity where I was now surrounded by a bunch of other students who were all these kind of people who found challenging chemistry questions to be something that was interesting to them. And so that felt pretty cool. And uh, that was actually, yeah, from that, I ended up getting selected to then continue on and go to the national selection, national training program, um, which that year was held in uh, Quebec City mm -hmm. uh, at the University of Laval or just outside of Quebec City. Yeah. Um, and it was a, you know, week long training <laughs> session where we would have multiple different lab tests, multiple practical tests, lectures from university faculty, um, and then just spend the evening studying and hanging out and going out into the city. And again, just really enjoyed that and, and got to know some, some people through that, that, you know, I still keep in contact with. And so to kind of cut the, the long story short, besides having been able to meet several very influential mentors who actually affected my whole career trajectory after that, um, 
I was I was chosen to be one of the four students to represent Canada that year at the Chemistry Olympiad, which was held in Moscow, Russia. And so, uh, yeah, basically had like two months to prepare and go and travel, travel to Russia and spend a few weeks in Russia to basically meet uh, the handful of students that were selected from every other country. And I think there were about 77 countries that participated. Um, and so there were a few hundred of us and it was, it was pretty crazy. Everyone was really excited about, you know, I want to be a scientist. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. I want to do this. And uh, the other three people that were there in my year, um, Gordon Bay, who is now a dermatologist here at Stanford, uh, Shervin Sarupi, uh, I'm probably pronouncing his last name wrong, um, but uh, he, he also is a physician at um, Harvard now. And uh, Donna Peng, uh, who is now a consultant in the space of um, materials and um, like solar energy and had worked worked in that. Um, and so and and I'm continuing on in science. And so, you know, everyone has gone on to do really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> don't want to interrupt but that's that's actually very cool I didn't know that you actually are from Canada well from Canada um and we we actually do have that in common although it seems like you're in Ontario uh based on the fact that you went to the that's University right. of Toronto that's um right. you have a Quebecer here <laughs> yeah. right, right on the other end but I think this is really cool and is was that the moment where you 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 know you went through this whole experience and when you think about it there's four Canadian children or young adults in your year that uh, went through yeah. that that went through the this experience was that the moment where you said okay I really want to continue in science uh yeah I think that was kind of the point where I felt like you know that whole last year of high school I thought chemistry was super cool um, I want to study. And as you very well know that, you know, the the applications for college are a little bit different in Canada. And so instead of this very protracted process where you take SATs and you have to write essays and apply to all of these schools and visit, it's much more pared down. And, you know, there is one day where everyone just goes in and everyone knows the the programs and the schools in Canada that they're interested in and then you just enter in and you get like four free ones or whatever it is now um and then you just send them your transcripts and then they just let you know whether or not there's a spot for you in that program yeah something like that yeah you had I had three choices and it was ABC and I think I had dental school to actually satisfy my father the second mm -hmm. one was biochemistry and the third choice was chemistry and the reason why the second one was biochemistry is because it started with a b and not with a c i would have not been a good chemist but i biochemistry i could do but it was it was that basically that simple uh although they they were i don't know if if in ontario they had this in quebec they had something called cut air cut r where it gave you a sort it's like a a, a really wonky mathematical formula that calculated the number of points you had compared to your class and so oh. you needed a certain specific number to enter that program so biochemistry at the time I think it was 26 or 29 and if you wanted to go to med school you had to have above 37 and then with med school you had an interview as well but you needed to have that minimum and then obviously they took the best top whatever number they had right. Yeah, I think it was a bit different because um, it was more like, you know, your grade 11 and grade 12 grades, and then they would just figure out which courses they were actually going to look at. Mm -hmm. And that was what they decided on for most places. Yeah, well, actually, now that you mention it, so in in Quebec, there is also this CEGEP that you have to go to. So you have finished high school and then you do those two years of CEGEP, which is kind of co college 
pre-university training. And that's those are the two years that count towards this, this number that gets associated to you. And once, if you, it's very difficult to increase that number. So the first trimester, the first semester and call in, in CEGEP is very important. If you start off very low, you're never going to go high enough to get into right. any school that you want. But it's it's a very interesting system. It's very different from uh, from from the U.S. system, definitely. Yeah, I haven't lived that, but I have French Canadian friends who did go through the CEGEP route, like Donna, yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so you, you're applying to university. Where did you end up? So, yeah, so I ended up at the University of Toronto. Um, and because I had already had some contacts um, with people who were there at that provincial and national kind of level, um, they had been pretty strong advocates that I should... I should go do research. I should go like get in the lab. And, and part of that came from the fact that, uh, you know, maybe for those who are not familiar with this program, but the chemistry Olympiad program is really pitched at high school students that are going to be tested on, I mean, at minimum college level curricula. So the expectation is that you know everything in university chemistry and physics. And so you are basically being tested on advanced synthesis, organometallics, materials, chemistry, um, polymer synthesis, uh, not the things that you would learn normally in high school. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant is that, you know, as someone who was starting as a first year chemistry undergraduate student, I had already read a lot of the fourth year textbooks or graduate level textbooks. Yeah. And so I didn't have the practical experience, but I had already learned large amounts of a lot of that course material. Um, and so the, the idea was, well, just spend time and get in the lab and, you know, see what you like. And uh, I was fortunate I joined the the lab of my inorganic chemistry professor that first year in like October and I was still so young that I could not I could not just show up to his lab I actually needed my parents to come in and then my dad had to sign to give consent to allow me to be in the research labs because wow. I was you know, I was still a minor um and so uh, this was October of my first year, and I was really drawn to his lab because one of the mentors that I think had a really outsized impact on me was um, Dr. Fred Fontaine at the University of Laval. And he actually gave me, you know, this signed copy of Crabtree's Organometallic Chemistry, um, saying, you know, I hope your passion for chemistry stays forever. Um, and, you know, I read that that summer and I was like, I want to go do some organometallic chemistry and try it out. And so I joined uh, Daytong Songs Lab, who is a new assistant professor at the University of Toronto. And my first project in the lab was helping a postdoc uh, with making these palladium um, binuclear and trinuclear uh, complexes. And so the idea was to make these sort of pre-catalyst complexes of palladium that had bridging bidentate ligands, and then try to use that as a way to get into modes of reactivity like NH activation and CO activation. And so that was the first first project I worked on. We actually got, you know, I got two papers out of that. Wow. That, <laughs> that time. Uh, um, and that was, yeah, like I was I was in the lab for about a year. Mostly, you know, I started with just making making precursors for people, um, learned learned how to do all of the different different types of easy transformations. So there's a lot of things you can, you can do. Uh, that are are quite dangerous and technically yeah. very challenging. And, you know, I was given the easy stuff, 
you know, scale this up, make this. this. Um, but I thought it was so much fun. Um, I got to grow crystals and uh, Deton was, was really nice because he would always go around the lab and he'd always check everyone's crystals that they were evaporating. So you do this by like solvent evaporation. And then if there were crystals in your vials, he would just run them and then just leave a structure on your desk. Nice. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it was cool to sort of, I grew at one point these like very large, deep purple trapezoidal crystals of this cool complex. And so, you know, it was awesome to sort of see, oh, well, there's structure. This is exactly what we're looking at. Um, and Super. yeah, so that's, that's sort of where I, I started. And then I kind of got interested more in like building, uh, building more complex um, ligands, trying to understand how we make some of the ligands for these metal complexes. And then I ultimately joined an organic chemistry lab. I joined uh, Rob Beatty's lab uh, at the University of Toronto. And I actually stayed in that lab um, until I graduated um, and started with a project where I was working with a graduate student because, I mean, I was a sophomore at that point. Yeah. Uh, and then once we published that paper, he kind of gave me a lot of freedom and said, well, you know, just do whatever, you know, I think this is a cool project, you know, mm -hmm. and it was a total synthesis of a fairly complex natural product, um, go make it. Um, so I worked on that for about two years. That was a fun project. Um, yeah. And then that's what really cemented that I wanted to go to graduate school. That was gonna gonna be my question is is and and so where where did GPCRs come into the play? We've talked chemistry. Oh yeah, yeah, a lot. So, but the, I mean, still, chem. When you think about the GPCR field, chemistry is chemistry is everywhere. It's important. But I want to know where do GPCRs? Where does biology? Yeah, get in enter Chemist your life. Yeah, chemistry is everywhere and everything is chemistry. But yes, to get to, you know, how how I am where I am now, um, actually, we can kind of think so I, I wanted to go to graduate school, I knew that I wanted to do that. Um, I had a few mentors that had strongly suggested that, well, you want to go to graduate school for chemistry, Harvard's the place to do it. Um, and so I joined the chemistry department at Harvard thinking I was going to be a synthetic chemist. I rotated in a couple of labs, but ultimately the lab that I think I really fell in love with, or labs, I should say, were uh, the people who became my my graduate mentors, Dan Kahn in chemistry and Suzanne Walker in microbiology. And uh, they, they're a husband and wife and uh, who run separate labs. And I joined the lab because Dan had been a synthetic chemist and he moved into becoming a microbiologist of sorts, right? And sort of became really interested in how do we use chemistry to understand biology? How do we build tools to understand biology? And so for me, as someone who wanted to learn something different, that also had the advantage of being very relatable. It was someone who came from my background that was doing something different out of their comfort zone. So maybe I can be successful in that environment as well. Um, and so, you know, I actually, my main project was a project in Suzanne Walker's lab. I worked on the uh, essential mammalian protein, uh, oglicnac transferase. Uh, this is a super cool protein, but not a GPCR. So I'll keep, I'll keep it short. But suffice to say that um, that project was a project in her lab. And when I had told Dan that I wanted to join his lab, he said, uh, well, I think that you might actually like this project in, in my wife's lab, who I, at the time I hadn't met. And he's like, I think you should talk to her. And I think you should join maybe as a joint student. And I said, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> um, because I think I sort of trusted that this guy seems like he's someone who can be supportive and is going to help me kind of find what, what is going to be the best for me. Uh, and, and so I really did have a lot of trust. Now I met Suzanne, she's a lovely woman. And so, um, you know, she, she was a great scientific mentor. So obviously that was not a problem. Um, 
But so then I worked on that project and that basically took from small molecule development aspects because there was an ongoing project in the lab of making inhibitors and developing better inhibitors, which had been challenging for glycosyl transferases specifically. Um, and then really a lot of what I was working on was protein biochemistry. It was almost like physical organic chemistry on proteins, understanding how the protein was doing catalysis. And I really enjoyed that. But towards the end of my PhD, I started to realize like this protein is actually this cool macromolecular assembly. And it actually has to bind and then release its substrates. You know, we had this model where it was actually unfolding substrates locally in order to access the catalytic site. It has to undergo these large gymnastic conformational changes as it's undergoing catalysis. And I had done work on crystallography. So we were routinely able to get crystals of OGT in the lab. Um, and, but I was, I was starting to think about, okay, I really want to, I really want to understand more about how proteins operate as large macromolecular machines and how do they change their shape in response to different conditions, because clearly that's intimately linked to how they function. And the other piece was that I saw colleagues in the lab who were doing different screens, genetic screens, and they were consistently coming up with, you know, this membrane protein in Staph aureus is really important for pathogenesis. And this is really important for this pathway. And this is really important for this. But those are the proteins that are hard to work with, or, you know, we don't really know what they're doing. And so I thought, well, if I want to challenge myself, I should find a system where I can work in membrane proteins. So I said, I want to work in membrane proteins and I want to work on, I want to work with somebody who is thinking about how conformational changes can be monitored, studied, measured. And so that gave me a pretty short list of people and Brian was pretty high at the top of that list, right? Um, and I had read a number of his papers and thought that this is, you know, really like fundamental steps of understanding. Like, let's go from, we don't know anything about how these receptors work to let's try and figure out what is this motion that's happening? What are the assays that we could possibly envision? And, and really, not being afraid to tackle a difficult problem was what really drew me to wanting to work with him. Yeah. So when when you re when you know you you made this short list of labs where you wanted to to work with and and Brian obviously was on the top. What next? Did you email? Did you call? Did you just show up at his door? <laughs> just show up? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I emailed him, and he emailed me back pretty quickly. Uh, and he basically suggested we just set up a quick zoom, uh, at the time it was Skype, Skype. <laughs> so a very, a very quick Skype and just kind of like, hi, nice to meet you. Okay. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you're, you know, what you'd be interested in working on in my lab. Okay. Sounds good. Um, you know, we talked for maybe 10 minutes and then he's like, I think you should come and visit the lab. And so I, I went out, um, I, I flew out to the West Coast and I interviewed um, in his lab. And this was actually a year before I joined the lab because we had an additional kind of wrinkle because again, we'd been navigating this two body problem through varying stages. And so I interviewed, I liked the lab, I told my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, yeah, I'm really thinking about this, um, this person for a postdoc and she was going to be matching into residencies. And so she had to go interview residencies. Um, I got really lucky. She made my life easy by being such a fantastic <laughs> candidate for her residency applications. Um, because she basically got interviews wherever she wanted. Um, and so she had interviews at UCSF and she had interviews at Stanford. 
Um, and yet, you know, I remember when Brian offered me the position, I said, I'm happy to work on fellowships together. Um, my tentative answer is yes, but if my girlfriend does not match at Stanford, then we're going to have to say no. Uh, and he said, yeah, no problem. We can work on stuff together. And if you end up having to go somewhere else, no hard feelings, very understanding. Nice. No, I, I think that's fantastic. So, but then you ended up, uh, joining yes. the lab because things worked out really well. Yes. Um, when, when you joined the lab, I mean, at the, until that point, you have not, you had not worked on GPCRs at all. You're very interested in the dynamics and in all the conformational changes that actually lead to the activation or inactivation of, of, mm -hmm. of proteins in general. Um, did you pick your own project? Did you build your own project? Um, how did that look like? Yeah, there there was sort of sort of a mix. So I guess the the way that things have kind of been in the lab and and the way that I think Brian constructs sort of the lab culture is that he lets people gravitate towards projects that sort of fit their interests. And, you know, he might say like, I think, I think that, you know, this is a good project or I think you should talk to this person. Um, and then, you know, you can, kind of find your way a little bit. Um, and so, you know, we had written a fellowship. Um, it's like I wrote a fellowship application um, based on a project in the lab looking at receptor kinases. And that's what I had sort of started working on as well when I first kind of came in was, you know, there were several other postdocs in the lab who were really interested in, kind of arrestins from different capacities and maybe how do we get uh how do we get some of this off the ground what are the sort of missing pieces that still needed to happen in terms of making the recombinant kinases establishing a lot of the protocols to be able to do in vitro phosphorylation assays that were you know uh they were we were able to convince ourselves that they had ligand dependent differences. They were, you know, stoichiometric phosphorylation as opposed to, you know, mixtures that oh. you tend to get when you, yeah, exactly. And so how do you develop assays for these things? And so and that's sort of where my postdoc had started. And, you know, at the time, I think there were, I mean, there have been great, great people in the lab. And so, you know, I think most closely I had worked with Mathieu Masseriel and, and Daniel Hilger, and those were the people that Brian were like, yeah, go talk to these people. Um, and, and so the idea was sort of like learning how to make receptors and then sort of learning how to make the kinases, putting the pieces together, building some of those assays. And then I think when we got progress, um, we had made progress on getting phosphorylation working. And Vincent, Vincent Huang, um, who was in the lab, he had been working on a uh, neurotensin arrestin complex. And there, I mean, it, it had just been a challenging target. And so one of the things that we had sort of thought of, and I think that what speaks to sort of the collegiality of the environment was it was sort of this idea of like, well, maybe we can try to revisit some of the things that were done before, but maybe maybe we can do them better with what we now know. Let's try it again. And I think working with him and with Matt, we were able to really improve the biochemistry of those preps. And I think that that's what ultimately sort of reinvigorated that project and sort of got that, that ultimately was the first, um, one of the first structures. It was published um, back to back with a paper from Bob and Yurgo's lab. And this was also in collaboration with Yurgo Skiniotis uh, because at the time they were really doing the EM for us. And 
you know, I think that we all have sort of brought different expertise to, to play and different strengths in that kind of that group of three of us. Um, I like so, that. Yeah, so I think, I, I, no, please go ahead. No, I was, I was, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, because so you're, I think you're the second person from, from uh, Brian's lab who joins me on the podcast and Kavya um, is also in yeah. the lab. And I, I, that, that what comes through is this collegiality, this, this, you know, marching band type of lab where everybody goes into the same direction and you guys help each other and you collaborate really well. And um, I think I don't have enough experience on the biochemistry side for these proteins, but I knew, you know, that they're uh, very difficult to work with. So there's a lot of finicky and a lot of adjustments to make, a lot of trial and error in order to get the right protocol to make sure that the assay is reproducible to get the right proteins to then at the end of the day, end up with, with a structure. And the, the protein quality is what gets you the structure as well. Right, yeah. And, and I think that there were aspects of this as coming from a PhD that was very, very technically enzymological, really focused on post-translational modifications. You know, I had a very different way of thinking about some of these problems. I had a lot of background experience in mass spectrometry. Yeah. Um, and so that was helpful for other aspects of bits and pieces of that project that needed to come together. Um, but I think that also just having this very different way of thinking, you know, I think Vincent was an extremely talented, is an extremely talented structural biologist. And I think we just kind of had different ways. And then, yeah. you know, Matt came from this this amazing expertise of membrane protein, as well as dynamics. He had done a lot of EPR. Um, and so sort of different flavors of background training that made you think about problems in a different way. Um, but still yeah. you got, you were able to develop a common language and solve a problem together, which I think is really phenomenal. Yeah, no, exactly right. All right. So at this point, you're you're doing a postdoc. You're in Brian's lab. Did you ever think about not staying in academia? Um. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's. Um. I I will say that this is something that, especially as someone who is currently staying in academia, it's maybe a bit of a not necessarily something that people would expect me to say in this situation, but I think that there's a lot of great science that is happening in biotech as well. Um, I certainly largely have thought that I wanted to stay in science throughout my, my whole training of my, my PhD through, and, and I mean like experimental science as opposed yeah. to transitioning into um, just like a writing or policy mm -hmm. job or something or consulting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that staying in science was always something that I felt like I wanted to do. And I think that the decision of whether to do it in academia versus in industry a little bit is more, you know, I sort of saw that as like, what are the opportunities that you have presented to you? Uh, and I think that there's a lot of people that because they have this idea of staying in, um, staying in academics, they're willing to overlook pretty good opportunities that get presented to them in industry. Um, but I have seen people take those opportunities in biotech and in industry and really find a lot of satisfaction in their job. They're able to do the science that they love at the same, same level of intensity. It's just, you know, you have slightly different timelines on things. You have slightly different priority structure that might develop. But I mean, in terms of like, if we're thinking about work in the field of receptors, most people are trying to understand how drug action works, how receptors are misregulated in disease. And this is what pharma is dealing with and thinking about all the time. 
And there's a lot of innovative opportunities to work on this in the biotech sphere, for sure. No, I, I totally agree. And I like the fact that you thought about your options, both options. I think I feel like it's typically one or the other. Uh, when when people think about, OK, am I staying in academia or going to industry, but not not don't necessarily take the time to look at both both sides of the same coin, because I think I think, as you said, you can do great science in academia and you can great you can do excellent science as well in, in industry, because at the end of the day, you're at, when you're in the private sector, you need to do great science because you want to cure diseases the product yeah. of your great science will end up in humans. So it, it has to be phenomenal. So tell us a little bit more about the, the job hunt, the two, the two body job hunt. Uh, well, I guess uh, specifically, specifically what, what would you like? Uh, what do you, what are you sort of thinking about? I, I think I, I, if you can give maybe some advice or what are the things that you feel like you did well or the things where you may, maybe you could have done better. I'm thinking here about people listening who are thinking about job hunting in academia and what would be your advice for them? Yeah. So let's see. Um, I guess I had thought a little bit about this sort of in advance of actually applying because I had sort of already corralled some of my thoughts into a grant that I submitted. So, you know, I think part of my suggestion that, or part of the thing that I think people should keep in mind is there are a lot of opportunities to sort of build milestones and landmarks into something like a postdoc as you transition towards more of an independent career. And I think taking advantage of these funding opportunities like K awards, um, you know, it's very, I think it's a good experience to start out with applying for fellowships. And then, you know, after you've been on a fellowship for a while and you have a little bit more independence on, on your ideas, I think that these K awards, at least in the United States, are, are a good idea. I don't know what the equivalent in terms of early career transition awards are in, in other parts of the world. Um, but that that's sort of a way to help you focus a little bit your ideas and sort of what you want to ultimately work on when you move out of your mentor's sort of sphere. Um, and then I would say that I think one of the things that I did well was um, I prioritized getting different people's input in how to structure my presentations uh, that I was going to give, specifically like job seminars. And I say that in what actually worked for me um, is that I'm pretty comfortable getting feedback from people in my own lab. Um, and so I actually prioritized getting input from people outside of my lab who maybe were less familiar with the technical sides of the work, but then also less familiar with maybe the impact or the significance. And then if those people were able to understand the high level narrative that I was making, uh, that would be more likely to have a big impact on an audience who's seeing that work for the first time. Yeah, I think that's, that's fantastic advice. So um, one other question I had is, let's say I'm a postdoc, second year postdoc, when is a good time for me to start thinking about, you know, next steps in my career, especially if I want to go into, into acad academia? How soon? Yeah. So that's the thing is that it's, it's a bit of a protracted haul, right? At least in the U.S. system, uh, because most of the applications in the United States are on this sort of they tend to be due around late summer through the fall, 
right? So most things are due through the fall. And then most of the time you're interviewing through the spring, like late fall through, through the spring you're interviewing. But I would say, you know, getting your materials together, if you work backwards, let's say you want to have draft documents and you want to get feedback from other people, you probably need it at least a year before you expect you want to leave at least a year. Um, and, and I think that, you know, th this is something where you, it always takes longer <laughs> than you think it will. And the actual like negotiating for a position varies wildly between institutions and depending on like how many offers you're balancing from other institutions as well. And if you have factors like, you know, let's say what, what my circumstances were, which were that I, you know, my wife also needed a job, um, you need then even more time because now you have to factor in other people might have to be involved from other departments and other schools and they have to do interviews. And so there's a lot of moving parts and specifically in terms of large university administrations, you know, just because your department chair might be interested and can deal with something in a week to turn it back around to you, it might take a month to get it from the Dean and, you know, all of these other layers. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I think the, the whole process, if everything works amazingly is probably like a year. So that means that you need to be ready two years ahead of time. Do you need you need to start thinking about this and working on this about two years ahead of time because you need about a year or so, you know, to mature your ideas, to to write those proposals, to talk to your you know to your mentors, to get that proposal taken into pieces so that you can reconstruct it before you can actually apply for these things. Yeah, I think that there is there is no such thing as too early is what I would say is like the sooner you can start thinking about some of these things, the more it's going to be helpful for you, right? Like if you are able to get some kind of tangible from your postdoc, you know, as early as possible, I would use that as the jumping off point to try and say like, you know, what are the directions? You know, that that's what I would say retrospectively. Yeah. Um and then also it's just, it is a like a tedious and isolating process. And so I think, you know, my other advice is just, you know, find friends, find, find people who are going through the same thing as you that can empathize and understand and commiserate when, you know, you both submitted 30 or 40 applications and don't hear back from 25 of them. Yeah. or 30 of them, um, you know, and then realize that it's not just you, it's other people that are all going through the same thing. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm curious to hear about your experience when it comes to exactly this, you know, this process. So just to give you kind of a, a background, I feel like universities in general don't prepare, sci don't prepare scientists and don't prepare us as postdocs to enter the workforce in industry. You have to get up and figure out, okay, what does a resume look like? How do I write an email? How do I apply for a job? And I'm wondering if it's the same case for academic jobs. Is there kind of a, you know, how to stepwise described, you know, manual that everyone can get access to and, and go from there other than trying to, going through your mentor or going through someone who's just went through the experience. Yeah. I mean, I will say also, depending on who your mentor is, they can be, you know, take Brian, for example, he is an extremely supportive mentor, but also job searched in a fundamentally different time. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. you know, I think he told me a story of how, you know, when he was looking for positions, he said that he just called the chair of this department at Stanford and said, do you have an opening? They said, sure. When can you come? <laughs> um, and, oh, it would be an HHMI position. Is that okay? And, you know, it was just, 
it's like such a different, it was such a different time. And it's not to say like, I think, you know, Brian was coming like with really exciting, you know, just cloned several receptors. And it was, it was a really timely opportunity for him to get in. And so it, of course, anyone would want him. Um, but I think it was just the time was fundamentally very different in, in terms of how one searched for jobs. And so, you know, my my immediate sphere of mentors were a little bit just out, out of disconnected with sort of where where things I think were. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think that talking to other people who had just gone through this, but there's this like hive mind community, right? So there's like new PI Slack and, and other, other groups like this. If you like join the new PI Slack, it's crazy. There's like 10,000 people in this Slack channel with, you know, I mean, you got to silence the notifications, but it, you've got people who are crowdsourcing all kinds of things, right? A uh, hiring committee wrote me this email. What should I say back? Or like this edge case scenario came up during my interview. What should I do? And basically getting input from a much wider range of people than you'd even get if you solicited the people that you know who've gone through this. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there are a lot of resources that sort of have this out there. But this idea of, you know, linearity, I think there's lots of people who take nonlinear paths in their training. And um, I think that you have to kind of see, like, you can't necessarily control how your project is going to evolve as a postdoc, right? And, you know, I had COVID kind of smack in the middle of mine. Some people had that affect them right at the beginning. Some people had them affect, affect them at the end, right? When they were looking for jobs and that had other impacts. And so there's all kinds of things that are outside of your control. And so even if you think you planned everything meticulously, you might still find yourself having to change your plans. Um, but I think that, you know, not having a plan or thinking that a plan will just find its way to you uh, is probably the the one thing you want to avoid. That was going to be that, that that's where I wanted to to get to, actually. So you still have to proactively go out there and figure out, OK, where are the resources? What do I have to do? And this is and it, it, it looks like it's it seems like a Herculean task because you have to do all this paperwork and all this thinking and all, you know, all this, but then you still have to do your lab work and your experiments and hope that you are lucky or you, you have you know, your, pro sometimes projects just don't pan out and it's nobody's fault. This is science. So I think, I think that that's the one thing that you can't really plan for, but really having an idea and being prepared for what you can control uh, is something that, that that is feasible and then you need to adapt to whatever results your data take you direction take you whatever res res direction your results take to take you to it's getting late <laughs> i'm having a hard time saying things no out all right so so then in, in your case can i ask um when you started applying for for academic positions um how many applications how did the interviews go how did you narrow it down to to the to the uh, to the position you're going to be taking in a few months? Uh, yeah, so I guess um, I probably submitted a total of um, I don't know thirty five to forty applications somewhere in that order. Um, and the thing is that a lot of applications now are pretty broadly written usually. Mm -hmm. So the reality is, you know, you will likely, unless there's something where you look at the job ad and you're like, this is me, exactly. Um, it's very hard to know exactly what they're going to want. And so you should assume that for a lot of the very generically written apps, they already have something that they want in mind and that you may or may not be that and you may or may not expect to hear from that place. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, 
But yeah, the interviews are time consuming and, um, but also really fun. So like, I think once you kind of get the hang of the interview, um, you can really take advantage of the fact that you are getting to meet people at, you know, a number of different institutions all around the country that want to tell you about their science, want to hear about yours, want to give you their views on your work. And so like that can be really fun. And I have made friendships through people that I've met um, just at interviews. Um, nice. And so that that's been really good. Um, I think once you get um, offers from places, you typically go for second visits, possibly additional visits after that, depending. Um, and I think in terms of narrowing it down, you know, what really kind of came as a, as a big consideration for us was, um, you know, what was going to be available for, um, my wife in that case, yeah. um, because there's different strategies you can do. You can either like both apply for positions um, and then just sort of mix and match, or you can have one person kind of apply for positions, uh, which is the route that we had sort of taken and then try to be more targeted and specific. And for me, I think the advantage is that there is a little bit more, I mean, different challenges for her position um, but there's a little bit more flexibility around hiring clinicians who mm -hmm. do research. Um, and so part of that is because doctors can always make money. Yeah. <laughs> it's a um, different set of skills. Yeah. I'm like a money sink. <laughs> she has the ability to actually generate <laughs> revenue for an institution. Um, and so uh, I think that that was, that was a big consideration for us. And yeah, I think ultimately geography and family were huge considerations because yeah. my wife grew up in Colorado and okay. her family is in Denver. Um, so. And so that cemented, cemented for us, um, you know, once we had narrowed down to a, a, a smaller list of places. Um, but yeah, I mean, you have a lot of a lot of different things that might appeal to you one way or another. You can decide in terms of monetary package. You can decide about colleagues, where you want to live, right? I mean, yeah. But it's it's so interesting because I feel like as postdocs, we were never no nobody talked to us about this. I mean, have you ever negotiated a salary before, uh, before before this this position? No, you know. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, in academic jobs, it is largely the case that you do not do much negotiating in salary. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, because most universities have fairly stringent regulations around equity now, which is good. Um, but it also means that it's not just like a one on one between you and the other person. You're like, I'm not coming unless you give me at least this much money. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is very little room, if any room for, for yeah, negotiating. negotiating, but there are lots of other things. And I will say that, you know, at least at Stanford, there are workshops and courses around academic careers, um, and around negotiations and running a lab and hiring people and buying equipment. And I feel like whenever there's opportunities to to attend something like this, you should do it because there's really a lot of inside insider trading that yeah. gets conveyed here where people will share a wealth of information, you know, of how they were able to negotiate this and just tips that they've seen from years of experience. Yeah. 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 I think we, we need to do a couple of round tables around these topics because it could be really useful for for everyone in the in the field and I'm, beyond I'm, too. I'm sure that it would be very useful for for people but yeah like the first time ever negotiating a salary I agree with you it's a it's a challenging yeah it's a yeah. challenging thing yeah well, then you do it a couple of times and then after that you're you know it's it's still uncomfortable but you kind of understand the interplay at least from from an industry perspective 
as to how things are done. There is a certain protocol to follow. John, I know we're beyond uh, beyond time, definitely. Uh, top three aha moments that you had as a scientist that shaped your trajectory. And after that, I'm going to let you go. Top three aha moments. So um, I would say there was one example that uh, comes to mind in graduate school. I was working on a problem trying to understand the mechanism of a certain transformation that this enzyme was doing. And the aha moment ultimately came from just looking at the products. So literally just look at the answer um, when, so I remember taking taking my experiment and I was doing a lot of mass spec. Um, I literally just ran ran the reaction on the mass spec. And I was able to actually see all of the different intermediates in that sample. And so there was a point where I said, this is this, this is this, this is this, therefore it has to be this. I finally, you know, I've been working on this for years and the answer was just look at it. And then the pieces will tell you what, what the mechanism is. Uh, so that was a big aha moment for me. Um, I would say another one that has sort of been, you know, I think what really was transformational um, in, in some of the problems that I've been thinking about in my postdoc was when we first looked at the sort of medium resolution reconstruction of our arrestin structure and sort of saw the phosphoinositide bound at the junction between the receptor and the arrestin protein. And this sort of, that realization that these lipids could actually be mediating direct protein-protein interactions, and we could see how those were changing the way that these proteins were interacting with each other, um, sort of opened several really interesting lines of inquiry for me. And then I've sort of seen how others in the field have also started to find really interesting examples of you know, positionally dependent signaling, uh, compartment specific signaling, um, and, and how membrane environments have been so important in, in shaping some of those interactions. And so like that was, that was a big one. Um, and then I would say it's not really a sort of point of not a scientific aha moment, but uh, the other time that I sort of had this aha was actually a couple months ago when it was the first realization that I was going to be leaving the lab, like when it really sank into me that I was going to be leaving um, and starting starting my own kind of venture and this realization of like, OK, now now I have to do everything and and figure out everything. And it was this. Like, oh wow, this is this is really someone's just gonna give me the keys and tell me to do whatever I want. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, I think lovely, lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh your time. And again, congratulations. And okay. we wish you all the best. But we will definitely find ways to help support the community. And for all of those who are just starting or looking for academic jobs, I think it's a, it's something that's very important to be able to cater to. John, thank you. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to stop recording and I will, I will take one more minute of your time. Absolutely. And, and after you. that. Uh, this was great. Course. Great talking with you. Can I ask you a favor? Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Many of you come back to watch our videos but aren't subscribed. Having more subscriber will help us get you more content. Also, mark your calendars and join me and your GPCR colleagues for the inaugural Endocrine Metabolic GPCRs conference taking place in the UK on April 22nd and 23rd. You'll be able to find more details about the event on the Dr. GPCR ecosystem under the events page. Thank you for joining us and listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We would like to thank our guests, our Dr. GPCR team, Attila, Ines, Montserrat, Ivana, Andrena, and Balint, if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com and subscribe today to our monthly newsletter. 
If you're part of the ecosystem, which we encourage you to do, it's free to join us. You'll be getting a weekly email about GPCR news. If you want to know what are the last latest papers that were published, what are the latest accomplishments of, uh, of your colleagues, uh, what are uh, the industry news in the GPCR field, and what are the job opportunities uh, in the GPCR field, please do join us in the ecosystem. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite program with your network and colleagues. With any questions or suggestions, please email us at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.